Right, good evening everybody. Welcome to the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee meeting uh, dated the 25th of January 2022. Um, first item on the agenda is apologies. I haven't received any apologies. No. No. Okay. So just move on to the, the minutes of the meeting on the 30th of November 2021. Um, I wasn't present at that meeting, so I'm going to ask for a, a move and a seconder. Councillor Maycott will move. Seconder? Councillor Harper. Thank you both. And take a vote on that, please. Cherie. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, declarations of interest, item three on the agenda. Do we have any declarations of interest? No? Okay, we'll move on swiftly then to item four, which is an update from the Midlands Partnership Foundation Trust. Um, at the November committee meeting, the committee requested that MPFT come and join the meeting again to provide an update on particular in particular on comms plan for Tamworth of the um, MFPT services, whether they be pilots or otherwise, that will be available and how we will have access to them. So tonight we're joined by Upcar Geeta, thank you for attending Upcar, and Linda Ram, who's Head of Communications here at Tamworth Borough Council, and Joe Sands, Assistant Director Partnerships. So if I can hand over to you, please, Upcar. Yeah, that's not a problem, and thank you for a re-invite to the meeting. It's always a pleasure. Um, I have pulled together a presentation just to provide an update. I don't know whether I'm able to kind of share that on your projector. I'm not sure we'll be able to facilitate that. We didn't have any prior notice to it. Yeah, I did email it. That's fine, I did email it, but it's just to kind of give... Um, this committee just an update in terms of progress that we've made since I last came and spoke to you so uh, despite um, COVID kind of significantly kind of creating some delays we have been able to kind of s progress some aspects of the transformation so we have co-produced a model with service user with, with service users which um, develops a, a service model which looks at the whole spectrum of need so we know from previous experiences and i'm sure you've highlighted during our last conversation that quite frequently people fall in between the gaps of provision so the model we've created creates these overlapping models of care which prevents that kind of um, gap in provision what we've also launched is um, a series of um, tender opportunities for local organisations to bid for around helping us to support individuals through navigating through health services, but also helping to provide some of the gaps in commissioning and help with engagement. So the specifications that have gone out are, there's a specification around housing, so we know that um, housing plays an important factor in somebody's mental health. So we've commissioned um, a service, um, and that's been done in partnership with the borough councils and local um, housing providers. Um, the other service that we're about to commission um, and is out for tender at the moment is financial wellbeing. Again, helping individuals to maximize uh, benefits um, or reduce debt. Um, uh, that, that plays a key part of some of the wider determinants which impacts on individuals' um, mental health. Um, we're commissioning um, a service, a lifestyle service. Um, so this is specifically for people with severe mental health. So although there is some commissioned service out there, um, when we spoke to service users, they felt that they were excluded from that because of their presenting needs and wanted a service that was bespoke to um, their individual needs. So we've gone out to market on, on that particular um, opportunity as well. And the last service is called Future Focus. So we've done significant amount of work with providers and service users. So what tends to happen is once you've had your clinical interventions, that's it, you're just kind of left on a cliff edge 
of provision. So what the future focus provision looks at is local communities providing that kind of reintegration back into that community, connecting that individual with local provision and generating that awareness within that kind of locality. So it works both ways. So it's an easy in, easy out type approach. So it's kind of smoothing out that kind of cliff edge of support. Um, and, and that opportunities kind of come out as well. So we're hoping to have um, contractors um, in place or service providers in place by April. Um, is when we're looking to kind of mobilize. And we, are, we have kind of asked for within the provision that we want local providers delivering local services. Um, in terms of um, communication, so had a conversation with, um, with Linda in terms of where are the opportunities for us to kind of join up and maximize um, um, opportunities to create awareness around the transformation. So last time you would have heard about some of the innovations that we've kind of created within our, um, um, in the transformation. So we've got a comms officer whose specific role is to focus on how do we create awareness of the transformation? How do we make people aware of some of the work that we're doing? We're now starting to kind of dovetail that with the opportunities and touch points that um, the borough councils developed. Linda, I don't know whether you want to kind of add to that. So we've talked about specifically around kind of liking each other on social media and promoting events um, through um, social media uh, platforms initially and then developing that further in terms of um, collaboration around joint um, uh, marketing opportunities. Um, I, I, we did discuss as well other sort of ways that we could support as a borough council, didn't we, in terms of um, any stakeholders that we already yeah. communicate with locally through our partnerships um, and also our sort of newsletter databases, our community champion groups. Um, so, you know, I have said to a car and Lisa, who's the communications person, referred to that, w you know, obviously as a council we'll support in whatever way we can to get the messages out. Yeah, and um, just on the stakeholder newsletter, we're about to launch a newsletter just specifically for um, stakeholders because we know there's a whole raft of people that wouldn't necessarily sit in the camp of voluntary sector or service user that may be excluded. So again, um, we've kind of made sure that the elected members will be on that distribution list and we'll make sure that Linda is able to kind of circulate that to her database as well. Brilliant. In terms of Tamworth specifically, so last time we talked about um, local teams, so we have now moved to um, um, a neighbourhood team that covers Tamworth, um, Litchfield and Burntwood. Um, and what we're looking to do is enhance that team through these additional voluntary sector services. Um, we are wedded to kind of delivering local services and we have been in conversations with um, Councillor Sheree in terms of some of those local venues and we have progressed um, um, towards having a more kind of local presence. However, the, um, the current pandemic situation has slowed down some of that progress, but we are making um, some significant headway in terms of making sure that our local teams have a local presence. Um, and that was kind of my update really. I'm happy to kind of take any questions if anybody has any. Thank you for that up, Carl. I don't know whether Joe wanted to come in at all. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, you know, obviously we've we've worked uh, up, Carl, and I have had several conversations around our community assets, the voluntary groups in Tamworth. Um, a lot of the voluntary groups have had the opportunity and, and will continue to have the opportunity to tender for services. So yeah, obviously whatever happens with the, with the mental health transformation, it will affect how we go moving forward. And obviously working with Linda. Um, the comms team to get uh, all those services out into the community but yeah I mean obviously we will continue and, and still work work that way okay thank you Do any members have any questions councillor Harper hello thank you very much for the uh, the update that was very uh, very welcome and uh, it's nice to see you back again um, if I may just um, reiterate something that we spoke about really in length at our previous meeting and we were very very keen 
Um, it was the uh, subjects of mental health issues, and we were very worried that people with issues were not having the information uh, and the ability to get in touch with you. We wanted posters putting up. We wanted the phone number putting as everywhere in um, in prominent places, doctor's surgeries, newspapers. We wanted anyone with uh, mental health issues to be able to contact easily and efficiently um, the service that, 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 they, that they need. Could you tell us what progress has been made on that? Yeah, so we have made progress with that. We've taken it one stage further, so we've commissioned a piece of work around um, a literature review around health literacy. Um, and what we found particularly in South Staffordshire um, is there's a there's a huge issue around health literacy though we expect um, the population to understand what we mean when we kind of circulate leaflets posters so before we start to produce those leaflets and those posters um, what we're producing is something called a style guide and that style guide will help us to make sure that actually the information that we're putting out there is accessible and easy to read by the population receiving it in a format that's accessible to them. So yes, we will be producing the posters, the leaflets, etc. But we want to make sure that we get the preliminary work absolutely correct because that's really important to us. We know the average um, reading age of the population is about 10, 11. So we need to kind of make sure that we're using language which is accessible to the population. Yeah, uh, one of the main points we were trying to emphasize um, was the fact that January, February are terrible months for people with mental health issues. And we were very keen to get something up and running um, immediately, as soon as possibly uh, could, be, could be made. Um, it's, it doesn't look as though we're going to get that. Um, it's going to take some while, and people with issues are going to be left um, devoid of any information or the ability to be able to contact you, and that's very, very worrying from our point of view. I mean, I wouldn't say that the, prov the provisions there, okay, so we've actively promoted our access number um, through our network, so um, there's a 24-hour, seven days a week, um, access uh, facility where um, um, individuals who have got a mental health concern can contact us and get a response. So that service is always in place and we have reiterated um, those contact numbers. I think what we're mindful of is before we produce any more marketing literature that we are um, um, we're taking into account the needs of the local population and we're producing information in a format that's accessible. So it's it's not to say that the provision's not there, the provision is absolutely there, and we are reinforcing how you access it. We're just m being absolutely clear that any future production of marketing material is going to be in a format using language which the population will understand. And that even means that we're, we're looking at signage within our own buildings as well. I mean, it's been quite an eye-opening kind of experience and we're doing that in partnership with the County Council so it'll be a joint style guide which both organisations will adhere to when we're producing any literature. Could I just make a comment then? So if you can just clarify for me. So my understanding is that the, the voluntary sector, um, be it whatever, whether the premises they have, they are already promoting this, are they? So we've, we've circulated, so we've got an access, uh, a mental health la um, helpline, which is open 24 hours a day, tw seven days a week, which is accessible to anybody who has a mental health concern or wants to kind of speak to somebody. And we've got that in partnership with a voluntary sector organisation, particularly the helpline aspect of that provision. We're constantly promoting that telephone number okay what we're saying is before we produce any more literature about the transformation 
about how services are going to change, we want to make sure it's going to be in a format that's accessible to the population receiving that information. Yeah, thank you. That, that clarifies it for me. Councillor Pupil. Thank you, Chair, and hello, Clara, and welcome hello. back. Um, can you just remind me what the time scale is for the project? Because I appreciate that the pandemic doesn't make life any easier, um, but I'm slightly concerned that there's a lot of work going into you know, style guides and sort of preliminary work. I don't want the whole thing to run out of time or indeed money before you've actually achieved anything for, for local people. Yeah, so I think we're absolutely clear. We've ring-fenced money um, that uh, has been allocated to the voluntary sector. So as an organisation and with partners in the north, we've committed to at least 20% of the investment will go to the voluntary sector. In fact, this year it's it's more than it's more like 50, 60% of the investment is going to the voluntary sector. What we have done is any underspend, we are um, exploring the opportunities of um, grants. So we know there's some hyper local organisations that uh, may not have the infrastructure to bid for money but may do some fantastic work on the ground in terms of that engagement. Um, and there may be opportunities for them to um, uh, bid for some grant funding um, uh, over the, the transformation. In response to your question, so the transformation is three years. Um, we're, we're coming to, uh, at the end of this financial year will be the end of the first financial year. So we've got another two years of transformation. Yes, the pandemic slowed some aspects, but we've not stopped. So like I've said, we've mobilised our teams to configure around geographies. We're looking at how do we have a more local presence. Um, we're looking and we've commissioned um, those services, voluntary sector services, which will hopefully go live in kind of April. So the, the transformation is moving um, at pace. Can I just ask another question, Chair? Thank you. Um, you may not be able to tell us because of you know, commercial sensitivities and so on, but in terms of local organisations, have we got Tamworth-based organisations who are working with you? Yeah, so we've got, what we've done is um, created um, a, a light touch procurement system called Dynamic Procurement System. So we've invited local providers to register. So they're on a framework. And then we put out opportunities, and it's anybody in that area can bid for opportunities. Um, um, and then, like I've said to you already, there might be opportunities that we put through a, a, a grant-based system instead that actually some of the more local, hyper-local organisations may, uh, may be wanting to kind of bid for money. And that enables us to innovate as well. So there may be things out there that we don't even know about, and it gives those small organisations the opportunities to to kind of have a, a slice of that pie and deliver some really fantastic um, delivery services in that local area. Councillor Greycher. Actually, Sheree people, she asked the question, your first question was exactly what I was going to ask. Right, okay. Yeah, Councillor Way. Thanks, Chair. Welcome. Hiya. It seems to me that you're going to rely heavily on the charitable services for this project. And relying on charity wouldn't seem to work. You seem to have, you need to have an infrastructure and not just rely heavily on charities. They do fantastic work and they get bogged down with all different stuffs. And it seems that this is going to be another stuff on top of what they're already doing. And there are brilliant organisations out there. And I, I understand when you say they've got a tender and they'll get grants. They should be given grants anyway. But my question is, from where we first sat in, I think it was last April or last May, do we have any data of, has there been any fatalities? Or has there been any hospital emissions due to mental health since we since we've sat here? Do you have any data on that? Um, I don't have that to hand. Um, 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 
you know, more than happy to kind of collate some of that information. So as a trust, um, we do manage inpatient um, admissions for, for mental health. Um, yes, we have had admissions onto that ward. The numbers I don't have to hand. Um, but what we do have with our inpatient facilities is a number of contracts which enable people to reintegrate back into the community after they've had an inpatient stay. Um, you make some really valid points about um, uh, um, uh, putting on to the voluntary sector. So what, what we're seeing with this uh, transformation is quite different from other investments. It's actual money and it's actually ring fence for voluntary sector organisations. So we're clear that actually health has got a role to play, but we also recognise we can't do everything, you know, and we're not in the market of trying to do everything when there's local providers that do a much better job. So there's local providers that know that local community can do that engagement who are better placed to do that. And there's services that actually are out there that um, like financial well-being that are much better placed to deliver those services than health can. So that's the whole premise behind the transformation is getting partners to work in a completely different way, to get them to work in a way that's cohesive and wraps around individual needs rather than creating these silos. I understand that people that have mental health for mm. a whole lot of issues. I, mm. I totally understand that. Well, it seems that you're going to have to have networks for everyone, say, one financially, one who's unstable, and, and so forth. So have we started to build these networks instead of just relying on charities that, well, this organisation will do that or that organisation will do that? Have we actually pumped money into a network where we can direct these people? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, it's through this transformation. I've had the opportunity to meet some fantastic people. I mean... You know, I've met Joe, and we've already started some fantastic work. So, particularly around financial well-being, where we've been piloting um, on the back of a contract that the, the the borough council have in terms of how how could that provision support people with severe mental health, and the outcomes we're getting is absolutely phenomenal. Um, you know, we've you know some really fantastic case studies of where we've been able to support the residents of Tamworth who are in significant debt can reduce some of that debt, but at the same time, it's alleviated some of their mental health concerns. So yeah, we, you know, we're, we're starting to make those, um, those, form those networks with local providers. But like I, I've, I've said before, health can't deliver all of these aspects of the transformation. You know, we need other partners to kind of help support Yes, the money has come to a health provider, but it isn't ring fence for just delivery of health. You know, like I said, there's other determinants which impacts on somebody's mental health, which we need other providers to work with us. But we need to do it in a way where it's coordinated and it's not siloed. Yeah, I'm, mm. I'm glad you, you're doing good work. And But one, more, one final question, if I may. Where's this phone number you keep on about? Because I've not seen it. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, I'll send it to Joe and to Linda to kind of circulate to you, um, um, the, the 24 hour. It's been up and running for a few years now. What we've done is enhanced it. And what I mean by enhanced that is make sure that there's clinical input 24 hours, seven days a week. We're enhancing it. So we've seen a spike in children and young adults. So we've made sure clinicians with that skill set are available to support those individuals that kind of call us as well. The other thing we've done is enhanced that provision. So we, we've looked at the data, and what the data tells us is that there's a, um, a need for financial support up front. So we've, um, we've got a financial wellbeing advisor that sits as part of that access function. That's not 24 hours, seven days a week, but in terms of core business, there's somebody there. We've commissioned a substance misuse worker to, to operate within that function as well, offering that front-end advice and support when people need it the most. Yeah, yeah Jen, sorry, can I just add there, Councillor Wade, as well? Uh, you know, obviously that work we've done with, with UPCAR and MFP, MFP, oh, MPFT, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> and, and the voluntary organisations in Tamworth, it will sort of form as well that core of our reset recovery to look at how we're working. 
but members might, you know, obviously our voluntary or anchor organisations and uh, that they work, that they do, they, they, they are fully aware of those access numbers, the advice centre, um, that they work with the mental health worker in the Tamworth Advice Centre and also our social prescribers who work through Community Together CIC who actually take those people from a, uh, from a, a primary care through doctors and actually try and actually give them something social and something out there in the community they can do, which is why it's very important for the, com for the voluntary sector who know the communities and know that work and we'd like to sort of build on that, certainly with, with, with health providers and Staffordshire County Councillors and moving forward. But yeah, I mean, from a point of view of mental health, I mean, uh, we have said something today to Councillor Claymore um, around the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment for Staffordshire, which is the health of Staffordshire. And within that, you will get a lot of data about mental health, um, about, uh, about well-being, and all the data for hospital admissions and so forth. And that will come through to you to comment on that strategy for, Sta for Staffordshire County Council. So you get a lot more data other, over and above, obviously, what UPCAR can give. That is actual health data across Staffordshire. So I'd look, you look at that. So that's just something I thought I'd raise. Councillor Claymore, if that's yeah, OK. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think Councillor Peoples got one more question and then we'll probably move on from there. It was actually a comment, if I may, Chair. Um, following on from what Joe was saying, I don't think we should underestimate how difficult it's been for people like social prescribers because, and, and for voluntary organisations. Um, just to give you an example, my organisation, part of Tamworth, I'm always plugging it, sorry. <laughs> um, and Community Together CIC did a joint venture of Singing for Fun, which uh, was a small group. We met once a fortnight, people who enjoyed singing got together and sang a few songs, and it was tremendously good for people's mental health because we had a number of people who were in that group who either had mental health issues or had um, were recovering from illness or had disabilities of one sort or another. It was a great thing to do. We had to stop because you're not allowed to sing in COVID. Well, you are if you're the prime minister at a birthday party, mm -hmm. apparently, but everybody else <coughs> can't do it. So um, we, we had to stop the group, and that group's been suspended now for two years. And, and that's just one example. There's loads of examples of, of things like that that haven't been able to happen because of the pandemic. And I think it's had a really severe... Imp th they're, they're little tiny things. But, you know, I'll give you an example of one chap. I'll call him Arthur because obviously I won't give his real name. In his 80s, recovering from a stroke, it was his one thing that he could come to once a fortnight, meet people, have a cup of tea. Just went. So, and, and that's, you know, across the town, across the country, people haven't been able to engage with those sorts of things, which are actually really critical for their mental health because mental health isn't about giving out pills or sitting with a psychiatrist often, is it, Cory? It's, oh, it's yeah. often about something really simple, just having a bit of human contact, cup of tea, chat, sorted, well, not sorted, but it helps. But anyway, sorry, that's my little um, contribution. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor People. I, I absolutely agree with everything <laughs> you've just said, other than the, the parties. Um, up car. Just a question from Councillor Maycock here. Councillor Maycock has lost his voice, so with your indulgence, I'll be asking questions on his behalf. Um, do people have to be referred by yourself, or can they self-refer? They can self-refer. So um, we've moved away from um, needing to go to your GP. Um, what's really clear about the transformation is that, and we're hearing loud and clear, is how complex it is for individuals to navigate services, particularly health services. So what, we, what we've said is that um, we want to remove those barriers. It's up to us as an organisation to get that individual to the right place and to coordinate their care for them. So it's about meeting what their presenting needs are rather than what's the diagnosis. I mean, some you, in some scenarios, um, yes, we do need to get to a diagnosis, but actually it's about what, what are the presenting needs of that individual and what components of which service is required to be wrapped around that individual to provide the care that they need. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, <yeah. coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
you've talked about this 24 24 7 wraparound service and the the phone number if you could pass that on to us just give them that to linda to okay share, yeah. <laughs> and make sure that not just the members of this committee but members of all all in the council have access to that um Councillor Maycock has handed me a recommendation. So, um, the recommendation for Cabinet to consider a feasibility of producing a wellbeing portal on the TBC website linked to the MPFT comms team. That's been moved by yourself. <laughs> Do we have a seconder for that? Okay. All in favour? Thank you. I think that will go some way to try and alleviate the issues that we have about comms. It will bring things together, I think, a lot better. Is that okay, Tracy? Have you got that? Yeah, because it's trying to get people to look at and look at what yes. <laughs> yeah, Councillor Harper, look, I'm just aware that we, we need to move on because we've got a quite heavy agenda. Thank you, Chair. I'm fully aware that we've got a, a heavy <laughs> night ahead of us, but... Um, <laughs> All I really wanted to do was to get a handle on the... Um, we've spoken a lot, a lot about local providers and voluntary organisations. Who are they? I need myself to get a grip on who these people are, how many there are, what sort of people are, uh, you're dealing with. I know you, it's a... If you can keep it brief, or yeah, I know it's sorry with your with, with sorry, it's like yes, can't repeat. I mean, and obviously we have through the obviously we, we, we're coming out hopefully through the pandemic. We we what we have we work very closely. We support Staffordshire, who are the brokers of the the, the voluntary sector in Tamworth and across Staffordshire. Obviously, we've got our key local organisations. So you'll be aware of obviously the the, 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 the organisations we've worked through 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 the pandemic. So we communities together, CIC. Um, Heart of Tamworth, the Food Bank, um, Number Eight Charity, which is a domestic abuse charity. Um, who else have I forgotten from the partnership? Which is cancer people. Sorry, there's about seven or eight key organisations we've worked with through COVID. As part of our reset and recovery, which we are going to talk about shortly, we are looking at other, you know, local groups within within. So you, you may have a stroke association or you know just just a, a well-being organization we've got places of welcome where people can just go and have cups of coffee throughout the borough um, they are just beginning to open up obviously due to face to face so that key database of organizations there are many that come through support staffordshire and we'd like them to be continue to be that broker of those organizations but as well there are little organizations that maybe you as members may know of within your area within your ward that could come to the table at some point certainly as up cars saying grants that mpft give grants that yourselves yourselves give through our community grants there may be people we don't know of just little organizations that don't want to go any bigger than just being people but they are very 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 um, important to understand what's out there within the local communities and to keep them going so there's a whole raft of organizations if ever you want to look in the first instance support staffordshire website is a very good place to understand what what organizations are working in tamworth they are not the be all and end all there are like i said little organizations but certainly you know we fund samaritans for arguments that we give a grant through to samaritans who will take calls 24 hours seven days a week that could lead through to the portal for the mental health um, support line it could actually get them to contact Heart of Tamworth or, you know, the befriending line at CTCIC. So there's many, many organisations we're working with and actually looking at making sure we understand that in the future, mapping them out. Thank you for that, Joe. Um, Thank you, Chair. There, there was a seminar a few months ago. I don't know whether you attended the seminar for... Yes, I did. Yes, OK. Because there were quite a few handouts that I, I've held. Hand out, hold on to so if you want a, a copy of any of those i can certainly there were quite a number of um voluntary organizations there um yes uh, thank you I, i'm aware of some but i wanted to know the the extent of it and i was very encouraged to hear the fact that you're saying you're looking for new organizations who can help join and can contribute themselves that's very uh, very yeah, encouraging so it's, it's not a static process so um it, you know we're not um excluding any organization we want to be inclusive possible mm -hmm. so 
yes, the, the dynamic procurement system enables us to do that. People can join that at any stage. Um, um, and, and you know, once you're on that framework, you're on it. Um, and there might be opportunities that might be applicable to that organisation, or there might not be. But like I said, we're, we're, we're going to be releasing you know, a number of grants as well, which might be more appealing to the size of the organisation or akin to what they're comfortable with doing. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, if I could just finish by emphasising the um, the number, it's no good having a helpline if nobody knows how to get in contact with it. I mean, we, we it's we putting it on the streets. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we get hundreds of calls a day on that ha on that number already. So it's not as if we're kind of keeping it close tight. You know, we're happy to kind of promote it. Like you said, we've been heavily promoting it through our networks because we know of the incidence of crisis points, particularly at this time of year. But yes, I've, I've shared it with Linda to kind of share with you, should you want to kind of share it with, with your own contacts. Well, I'm sure absolutely Linda will do a fantastic <laughs> job at doing that. So, no, I'm absolutely confident of that. It's just that not everyone has got access to the internet, and those are the people who are going to fall through the net if we're not careful. Thank you. Thank you for that, Carl. Thank, Thank you for coming back. And, okay. and I'm sure we'll have you back at some other point to, to for it. the progress. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you, Linda. Yeah, and Joe, I think, are you staying, Joe? Okay, so if Bob Carr and Linda would like to, I mean, you're welcome to stay if you wish. Okay, we now move on to agenda item five, which is resetting recovery. Um, we have Tiva Mustafa here, um, Zoe, and Joe. Um, I was going to give a brief overview on it, um, but I think it's probably better to hand over to Tina because she's the expert. <laughs> I don't know about that chair but thank you very much for that uh, introduction and evening councillors we're delighted to come along and talk about the council's um, recovery and reset transformational agenda. Um, in your pack you will see that there was a visual shared in terms of that scrutiny oversight along with the highlight reports that you're going to hear from uh, colleagues a bit later on around smart working, customer services offer and arrangements and vulnerability, which I know we've touched on some earlier with the previous agenda item. Um, but just before I hand over, I did just want to set some of that context and um, just remind uh, committee members of the sort of journey so far around recovery and reset. Um, so the primary aim, if you like, is to reimagine services to repurpose budgets and realise real efficiencies. Um, across what is a framework around recovery and reset that was agreed through Cabinet back in October 2020 now, which covers um, seven projects which are illustrated there on that visual within your pack. Um, and has, has subsequently been subject to um, two Cabinet uh, cabinet paper on the 29th of July and then full council on the 25th of August along with a range of cross-party political discussions around progress on those projects. Um, if, if you remember that the decisions in July and August last year were around decommissioning of Marmion House and to look at the feasibility um, on this site in terms of regeneration and wider place shaping and certainly infrastructure safety and growth considered those uh, projects in, in a lot of detail last week um, but in order to be able to um, enable that decommissioning then clearly we would need to adopt principles around smart working um, as well as continue conversations with our stakeholders and, and customers around um, our customer services offer and in particular um, to set out what our strategic approach is to vulnerability um, so that that vulnerability offer can support that customer services principle um, and outreach as we look to relocate uh, from Marmion House and the, the sort of timeline around that is and the business case that was uh, financially agreed through full council last August was that we would move between April and June 2023. Um, so obviously 
tonight it's an opportunity to talk about those particular projects in more detail. You've got copies of the highlight reports and um, the team are going to seek to do three things really. Just explain what's in those highlight reports um, and what the key milestones and work packages are. Um, as well as just inform some of the key dates for you so that as a scrutiny committee as you look at your work plan you can timetable things for when you want us to come back uh, on those areas. For example, um, we plan and it's on the forward plan to go back to Cabinet on the 7th of April um, with the next steps in terms of that uh, approach in terms of what it looks like in terms of moving out of Marmion, and what that customer services office is going to look like, um, what the arrangements are in terms of space requirements following the implementation of smart working subject to those consultation processes etc and then the third thing is really just to get your feedback observations questions so that we can inform the development of that cabinet um, paper so so yes in terms of the recovery and reset agenda it is transformational it does seek to um, deliver across a number of those areas um, and I'm happy to hand over to uh, Zoe in terms of starting off with our smart working and our customer services offer projects. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Sorry. Thank you, councillors. Good evening. Um, I'm going to start with a customer offer, if um, you're happy with that. So um, before the world turned on its head a couple of years ago, um, our customer service team were seeing a shift in the way that our customers wanted to interact with us. Um, historically, we had 50,000 visitors a year come through the front doors. That had reduced um, pre-pandemic to 37,000, so a big drop. Um, 2,000 of those were for social services and 4,000 of those were um, for the TIC. So we, it, we had a rough translation of about 600 visitors into reception every week. Telephone calls to the customer contact centre remain at around 5,000 calls per month, have done from before the pandemic, and they didn't um, increase significant as a result of the face-to-face -face reception closing. Um, we did work proactively with the, uh, the rest of the organisation to streamline um, processes and uh, give um, new ways of delivering services to support the customers through the pandemic. For example, the taxi licensing process, we've made that a digital process as much as we can, but we still um, had some face-to-face -face interaction where we needed to um, in there. We've also um, um, increased our web chat facility. Um, it's increased from about 2,500 inquiries in the year 1920 before the pandemic to over 10,000 um, in 20, uh, 19, 2021. And our internet traffic, this was where we had the big push, was um, from 57,000 users in 2018-19 to just over 78,000 in the first quarter of 2020. So there was a, a massive increase um, of how our customers wanted to interact with us and a big push around the um, internet. So with the customer offer project, there are four key work streams. Um, the service delivery, the actual offer that we're giving. Digital transformation, so how we can move to more digital and more efficient uh, ways of delivering our services whilst ensuring our most vulnerable customers are supported. The environment where we deliver the service from and the consultation and engagement strand uh, with our residents, staff, partners and elected members. So the offer has evolved, um, working with our portfolio holder um, and uh, cabinet over the past um, few months. So the guiding principles around the offer are, it is a portable service. So the actual venue doesn't really matter. The service that we can offer to our customers can be picked up and put into any venue and it will provide, it's suitable of course, and will provide the full range of our services to stakeholders. Um, we are committed to five days per week in the town centre, a drop-in service without um, appointment. So that ensures that our most vulnerable customers are retaining that face-to-face -face service. Um, the community engagement, um, we have shifted the emphasis throughout the project. And um, 
the purpose of it now is from um, gaining feedback on specific proposals or opening times is actually to get some generic feedback uh, regarding um, our customer services in terms of pre-pandemic, during and post-pandemic and testing some of that data that we've collated along the way and about how um, people want to interact with us. We're also going to be getting feedback on an updated complaints policy as well. So we've also committed, uh, or we uh, we feel that the um, a co-located back office with the town centre reception presents the most efficient option. We are focusing on digital acceleration. I know I've mentioned it, but it is a long-term aspiration for us to um, get better at that. Work with the community to enable them to get better with digital um, um, in interaction. We do also, one of our drivers is that we may, uh, we're committed to removing waste demand. So what I mean by that is any um, action or step in a process that doesn't add value to the customer or doesn't demonstrate value for money from um, the use of our staff. So we, we're constantly reviewing processes. We're focusing on a seamless customer journey and looking at um, supporting e-enabled access to um, positively um, impact um, on the customer's journey. So we have got a face-to-face -face customer offer at the moment. It's being delivered via a signposting service from our tourist information centre at the assembly rooms until we've committed um, until April 22 for now. We have been delivering that since September and there has been limited um, enquiries for our general mom, um, services that would have been um, delivered from Marmion House reception. We've had under 20 formal inquiries for things that people needed help with. Um, so things like um, support with council tax bills, um, bus pass holders, housing application form and um, some document scanning. So really limited um, inquiries. We have improved the signage following feedback from councillors um, for the services that we're providing. You might see if you, you look at the front door, it's the, we've got contact us and there's a kind of a catalogue of if you want, if you need this, it's that number. If you need this, it's that number. And we've also engaged with the CIC together. Um, they've actually got one of our contact numbers um, lists on there. And on that, it does say that if oh, all else fails, you can um, access face-to-face -face services through the assembly rooms. <coughs> so whilst, um, the option with the assembly rooms is operating successfully at the moment. We are aware there is a risk um, with respect to the commercial operation of the assembly rooms and the complex needs of some of our most vulnerable customers. We are continuing to collect data on those people that are coming to talk to us and monitor the, the impact, um, if there is any, on the operations of the assembly rooms. In terms of the offer from April 2022 to 2023, 20, um, that will be presented to um, Cabinet for decision on the 7th of April and the longer term options will be um, developed in line with the Cabinet decisions around the building utilisation and what our long term plans is, um, are for housing um, the Council. So um, the key focus around our work is to collect data on customer demands and needs and also find out how they're accessing our services, how they want to access our services and we will test those findings through our customer engagement. <coughs> um, we have been working very, very closely with um, agencies who are dealing with our, um, some of our most vulnerable residents, including CIC ta um, Tamil Together and Support Staffordshire. And those two organisations are assisting us with a trial of our community engagement survey. So it was issued earlier in January and they're asking their customers a series of questions about Tamworth Borough Council, the delivery of the services, how they're accessing us, and then they'll feed back to us in terms of was the survey easy to complete um, and any other questions and comments that will enable us to improve that um, and change the survey for the main public engagements which is coming in the coming months. Um, we are also working very closely with the vulnerability strand of the Recovery and Reset um, programme so we can ensure access to as many citizens as possible. Joe's talked about all of those different groups. Those are the groups we're going to be working with when we go out to survey um, because we're very, very aware that it is those vulnerable groups that I know councillors have said tonight that are concerned about us missing. So that is one of our big focuses. <coughs> so. The next steps are that we're going to continue to get feedback on the survey. Um, we're going to meet with the portfolio holder and our executive director who've got delegated um, 
local authority from cabinet um, to, uh, from to uh, and council to agree our engagement plan uh, be developing the options for the cabinet report and starting looking at implementation plans for the period april 2022 to 23 now, there's been a, a lot of work going into this project and just um, giving you a synopsis in, in five minutes might not even do it justice, but the um, work that the team have done on it is absolutely phenomenal. So um, I think it's um, a great credit to them. So um, <coughs> I would welcome any views or questions from the committee. Thank you for that, Sarah. Um, yeah, and the team are to be congratulated for working so hard on it. Um, any questions on this particular section councillor harper thank you chair yeah, uh, yeah hello <laughs> um i think we're all agreed that um particularly the assembly rooms is a totally unsuitable uh venue for people to come and discuss council business or um any sort of uh, sensitive subject um the provision of uh purpose designed Event, a purpose designed venue, I think most of us would agree, is absolutely essential and can't come soon enough. What is the current arrangement with people who do come asking for um, information? Hopefully it's not sort of conducted around the, the box office or anything. You do take them somewhere or there is some sort of private area that, you, that people can discuss their concerns. Thank you. Thank you. It is a signposting service, so... Of, um, we are, um, we've got um, phone, uh, phones that people can phone through to different departments. Um, it, d it depends on the nature of the inquiry. It might be simple form filling, which they have been able to support with. But we, we, are recogn we do recognise about vulnerable customers in the box office, and it's not that type of business isn't happening there. We are arranging appointments for them to see officers as necessary if it's that kind of concern. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any more questions? Officer Wade, uh, not Officer, <laughs> Councillor Wade and then Councillor Pupil. Welcome. Thank you, Chair. One question, you, you say you got, you got this at, at assembly rooms where people can phone and access people they need to talk to. As councillors, we find it difficult to get a feedback within a day. So how do you expect them to get feedback so quickly when we, when we struggle to get feedback in a day or two days? I mean, it's five days down the line where we get an email with our concerns of what we've had given to us. Okay, in, in terms of um, the customers coming in and asking for support, um, the officers at the assembly rooms can talk directly, either email or um, on the telephone with the relevant officers to be able to get them an answer. I don't feel I can comment on um, the length of time that I it takes for your queries because I'm not, um, I'm not aware of the nature of them. And uh, if you want um, to chat to um, somebody about it with a specific department, then um, you need to give one of us a call. Thank you, Zoe. Um, Council people. Thank you, Chair. I just wondered if you've got a breakdown of the sorts of queries that are coming um, and uh, ha any information on how they're signposted. I do share concerns, I think, that have been expressed about, um, you know, it, it's all very well to signpost them to a particular area officer or whatever, but sometimes people come in with something that's quite urgent, quite sensitive, need dealing with there and then. So I just wondered if you've got a breakdown of the types of query that you're dealing with. Um, and I did have another question, but it, it's a really small one. Um, you mentioned 78,000 online interactions in the first quarter. Have we got that many people in Tamworth? Um, because that would mean every single person in Tamworth was contacting you at least once in the first quarter, which seems a bit strange. But anyway, um, that's that's a, that's a, 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 an aside. It was really the question about the types of contacts, what people are asking for. Have you got information on that? I have, thank you. So I'll, I'll cover off the um, the 78,000. That's 78,000 hits on the website. Not everybody, that's not a, a contact to actually speak to us. That's hits on our website. Yeah. 
Um, in terms of the types of queries, we have had, I'll um, just refer back to my notes here, um, council tax queries, um, uh, filling in of housing forms, um, some scanning queries, but it has been very limited. And we, we are aware that as we come out of the pandemic and people are, go are going out more, that that may change. And that's why we're constantly monitoring and why that this is a short-term interim measure that w is running up until April. And if, if we need to do something different in the meantime, because of the nature of the queries we're getting, we will. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm speaking for Councillor Maycock now. Um, in the report, it says, meet with Tamworth CIC to discuss shared intelligence on vulnerable client groups. Um, regular meetings now set up. Um, the question is, what is regular? Okay, it's um, Ali, our Head of Customer Experience, meets with Lee at the CIC every week. Um, and he is giving her an update of the um, kinds of service demand so that we can um, do a cross-reference. So, for example, the latest meeting was last Friday, um, and Lee reported that about a third of their inquiries were on bef uh, befriending. They were getting a lot of inquiries around fuel poverty. They're doing some form filling as well, and approximate, they're getting approximately five of our housing applications a week. So what we've done there is said to Lee, actually our customer service officers um, should be assisting with that, so they're going to be signposted back to us. So Lee's going to, be, because then he can concentrate on some of his other um, projects. And also they get, it, they get um, inquiries about um, council tax bills and rent letters and again we've got um, Lee's going to be signposting his customers back to us um, and we've made some improvements on how the letters are so that they don't promote so many queries from customers and um, that's been within the last um, few um, few months so um, Lee's going to give um, Ali a update of his um, data each week obviously uh, anonymized it, um, the data he can share so they can discuss it on a Friday and see if there's anything that we can improve the services to either his customers or ours by uh, not duplicating work. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, I might ask this other question then at, at this point. Should we include that one in this section? Yeah. Right. Okay. Another question then. Um, it's noted that a risk would be vulnerable residents will not be catered for. I, mean, I know you've covered a lot of that. Um, but Councillor Maycock, do you have a question? The pandemic has highlighted those that may be classed as vulnerable. Has the council made a list of these residents and will they adopt a holistic approach in assessing their needs and helping them in any way the council can? I think, I think so, Councillor Claymore, like that's, uh, that's where I come in on, on, on that vulnerability uh, thing. So yeah, that's what I, will, I will take that as we're going through and hopefully that will answer that or any supplementaries to that. Lovely, thank you. Um, any other questions or comments from Councillor? Councillor Graycheck. Uh, you said these arrangements are in place until April. Um, do you envisage that the staff will ever return to Marmion House as they used to on a permanent basis until the um, decision's been made as what, how, when we're going to decommission Marmion House? That one, it will be in the options appraisal for the Cabinet report in April. Um, and in terms of staff returning, I'll cover that, if I may, with the Smart Working update. Yes, please. Do you want me to move on to Smart Working Unless now? Unless there's any more questions on the last section. Councillor Harper? Please forgive me. I'm, I'm not at all sure of the protocol or, <laughs> or how, how we do these things, but I wonder if we can... Um, do I, if I need to move anything or, or, or basically um, propose that we contact the cabinet or whoever urging them with the very greatest of speed to establish a town centre venue for this sort of work to be um, uh, centred from so can we that do that? is that a recommendation that you're putting forward? yes yes okay <laughs> thank you did you get that tracer? I'm sorry Yeah, yeah, you did point out it was only till April, didn't you, in the assembly rooms? Yeah, and post-April will be through, cab uh, 
through decisions at Cabinet. Right, OK. So, yeah, I think that's a valid recommendation then. Oh, Tina, yes? Th thank you, Chair. D just to answer Councillor Greitrich's his question a bit further, I mean, as, as Zoe set out, um, at the last Recovery and Reset Board, which was before Christmas, we did present a series of options that would deal with both the immediate issues, as Zoe set out, up until April this year, but then would also deal with from April 2022 to April 2023, which would be that inter interim or transitional step um, whilst we look into source rental accommodation within the town and then what the arrangements are going to be from 2023 uh, onwards. Um, so obviously that detail and that analysis and that evidence needs to form part of that options appraisal to Cabinet on the 7th of April, as though is kindly set out. Um, in terms of from April 2022 to April 2023, the reopening um, in, a, in, a, in a more structured and contained way of Marmion House um, was a consideration um, and will be part of the assessment in terms of that Cabinet report in terms of whether that just makes better financial sense whilst we're looking to relocate in terms of a town centre back office and reception service. So certainly there is an option there around looking um, in for that 12 month period, but at this stage, um, we haven't got all the intelligence to support a conclusion one way or another. And equally, as Zoe has said, we are still in the pandemic. And you know, whilst restrictions are looking to be eased, in a variety of ways over the next few weeks, we're still looking to keep our staff safe and well during that time. So that decision during that 12 month transitionary period will be based on a combination of factors. But certainly reopening Marmion um, was one of those considerations on the basis that would appear to be one of the least costs whilst we're looking to invest in the town centre for a more medium term rental solution, if indeed that in itself is also supported. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for clarifying that, Tina. Um, another question from Councillor Michael. Um, will the recommendations be ready for the when Cabinet meets? Is it in April? Chair, we hope so. Um, the team all met yesterday as part of our usual monthly operational meeting. We've got a corporate project team. You know, we've um, I think all of the assistant directors are part of that. Um, and we shared what would be some outlying um, cabinet requirements in order to progress that decision. We've got a meeting with our executive leadership team on the 9th of February to talk about that detail and there's another recovery and reset board on the 23rd of February with our cabinet colleagues as well. So I think we're all clear what the ask is in terms of what we need to provide around the business case for those decisions, um, but equally we're all, and we, we said this at Infrastructure Safety and Growth last week, we're all acutely aware that it is a really ambitious target. Mm -hmm. To source accommodation in the town for 2023 means, you know, we've got to enter into negotiations on leases, we've got to fit out properties, we've got to have it ready to be handed over to Zoe and her, and her teams to train and prepare staff to occupy it, all of which we've probably got 12 months to do. So I think the the risks that we have identified within the programme and will also be subject to a discussion at audit and governance in March um, are that we will do our very best but obviously it's conditional on some of the things around availability of premises um, and some of it around availability of intelligence and data that supports that. Um, but certainly those interim steps around what we do up until April and beyond will feature as part of that cabinet decision and we'll be looking to to cabinet to make some recommendation uh, to make some decisions based on those recommendations but certainly as a health and well-being scrutiny if you want to make recommendations back to cabinet on that that will help structure that business case for us so thank you thank you tina um what I propose to do is hang on to that recommendation for now till we get through the rest of the report because there may be further recommendations that we might be able to um, put on block. So we can just hang on to that one for the moment. And so, do you want to work on, is it smart working? Yeah, please. Thank you, Chair. 
<coughs> so um, in August last um, year, as Tina laid out, um, the recommendation from full council was that we would adopt principles of smart working, recognising that it was an enabler to decommission Marmion House and delivered a more tailored customer service mm -hmm. offer. So um, a little bit of background, um, we have embraced for a number of years um, the benefits of flexible working through um, an existing agile working policy. So that meant that some people would work from home sometimes, some people worked from uh, were home workers, um, but obviously in March 2020 um, this was accelerated when we had the mandate to work from home due to COVID and we then got all of our staff out of Marmion House working from home, set up and running within a few days, which was an absolute incredible um, achievement for the ICT team. So when we've been developing the smart working model, um, we've um, considered a number of principles. Firstly, flexible working to fit with the needs of the business whilst maximising the use of our assets and space. Um, the work needs to be done at the most efficient location based on the task customer needs, the individual and the team. Office space to be allocated to activities and outcomes rather than individual individuals and we were to collab um, create collaborative space for team and partner sessions. Um, a back office space with digital booking system so that that includes hot desks, designated desks for specific activities and some scalable meeting space with flexible ITC, uh, ICT systems already in situ. And that would be backed up by a set of terms and conditions which supported the new way of working. So, as I said, we all, um, everybody worked from home during the pandemic. 31% of our staff, though, continued to be based on site. So you've got street scene, the cleaning team, castle staff, street wardens, scheme managers, and 69% um, staff then were working at home. We have continued to communicate with staff all the way through and have conducted two staff surveys, which largely reflects that those who are working from home are satisfied with, um, with it, whilst preferring the opportunity to come into the office to collaborate for specific tasks and duties. However, we do have some um, staff who don't want to come into the office at all now. They are very happy working at home and co prefer to collaborate by using technological means. So over the past few months, we've developed the model and in November, a collective agreement was um, formed with our recognised trade unions. So the basis of this agreement is every role within the council has been designated in one of three categories. That being site-based, so people, uh, staff who are unable to carry out their duties at home. Home-based, the majority of the duties will be carried out at home. And hybrid, some duties can be carried out at home, but more than 40% of their time has to be carried out on site. So we've got 43% uh, of staff of home workers, 22% are designated as hybrid, and 36.4% of staff are designated as site workers. All staff have been communicated with. They had a formal letter on the 13th of December to inform them of their designation and where any other terms and conditions have, um, were changed for them that affect, would affect their contract. So we've also written into contracts that every member of staff will have a contractual requirement to attend our office base on two days per month. We have um, reviewed, um, consulted and agreed 25 separate terms and conditions of service. We have agreed um, that a home working allowance of £26 per month will be paid from the 6th of April 2022. Hybrid workers will receive 50% of this at £13 per month. So in line with employment law, to change people's terms and conditions, a period of formal consultation has to take place. 252 individual one-to-one -one consultation meetings have been scheduled and took place between the 20th of December and the 21st of January. Each employee then has got 30 days from their consultation meeting to consider and, make, um, and give feedback on the um, terms and conditions for them. We do have a small number of meetings that are outstanding um, for those who couldn't attend their appointment for one reason or another or and our new starters. So the consultation does also allow for staff who are happy to accept the contract and consultation before the 30 days is up um, to end it. And as at um, yesterday, 89 members of staff have accepted the new contract. 
So we have continued to con um, constantly communicate with staff and as a result of questions that have been asked in the consultation sessions, we've sent out two sets of frequently asked questions which each had about 30 questions within. If a member of staff is unhappy with the changes, they do have an opportunity to appeal which, and those appeals will be scheduled for later in February and early March when all of the consultation um, periods have ended. So in terms of next steps, we'll be issuing the, uh, formal contracts to those staff as they accept them, um, developing a rotor for the two days per month for teams to be coming back into Marmion House um, from April 2022 and also to develop a formal smart working policy and refresh all of the um, current policies to inco incorporate the new smart working agreement. And again, it's been an absolutely significant piece of work and Jackie Noble, who's our head of HR, has been absolutely outstanding in terms of the planning, organising and delivering of the project. I mean, just the number of consultation meetings that Jackie and Christine, who's senior HR officer, have done in a month is phenomenal. So um, we really um, are proud of those, um, the efforts. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Zoe. Oh, I've got a couple of um, questions I wanted to ask. Um, the staff that you've designated as home workers, will they be having risk assessments carried out at home in connection with the type of work they're doing and their computers and whether everything is suitable for home working? <laughs> Simple answer, yes, that's part of the arrangement. Sarah's looking round at me because she looks after corporate health and safety and we're already working with Jason Hodges, who's our health and safety officer in conjunction with Litchfield, to actually develop that. So, simple answer, yes. So, yes, and will they be um, reviewing those health and safety risk assessments at a prescribed amount of time? Yeah, there'll be a whole policy around it and procedure. Thank you. Um, the consultation was completed, was it last week? On Friday. Yeah, but on in the main, there are a few um, straddle, uh, straggling meetings left. Without go. going into any, obviously, um, personal details, um, what were the negative reactions to it? Some staff, um, as I mentioned earlier, some staff um, feel that they don't need to come into the office even for the two days a week. Conversely, Right on the other side, we also have some staff that want to come back and prefer not to homework, but it's, um, it's not about an individual, it's about the role and the requirements of the role and, um, and where that can be carried out. Um, other than that, it's been um, accepted um, really well. Um, we have changed some, desig um, some first aid, uh, people who, who are actually first aiders at the moment, because they'll be a home worker, they don't need to be. Um, and also we've recognised that some site workers may not have a first aid qualification, so we've done that. Uh, so their role has been designated as needing a first aid qualification. However, if somebody says they don't want to um, do first aid or queasy, or we're not going to force anybody into doing it. So that's that's been quite a, um, a key theme. And I think the, re the biggest key theme has been the changes to the flexi time. Um, because that's one of the things that we've changed. Um, we've reduced the um, amount that people can carry forward to 14.8 um, uh, um, hours, which is equivalent of two days. And also um, we've reduced the amount that people can take in one month um, flexi time to a day and a half, which is 18 hours-ish. So, uh, but that's been the biggest um, com um, area for comment. So is that the flexi time, um, is that per month? Is that per month? Yes. The two days you can carry over? Yes. Yeah. So at the end of the month, if you've got anything more than that 14.8 hours will um, be removed from their flexi balance at right, the end okay. of the month. Okay. Questions? Um, Councillor Greatrix. Yes, thank you. Um, if people really don't want to work from home, uh, do they ha have any options? Because I think it's a well-known fact that if you are permanently working from home, you can actually suffer mental health issues. Uh, my own granddaughter works from home and she said it's driving her crazy. She goes in the front room and works all day there and comes out. She's got no interaction with her colleagues apart from online and she actually hates it. And sometimes she tells me she's absolutely stressed out of her mind. 
So is there any provision for people who actually, even if they're designated to be home workers, is there any, going to be any provision at all for them to come and work back permanently? Okay, so we will look, look at I cases like that on an individual basis in terms of if, if people have mental health um, worries because of working at home, we'll look at them on an individual basis. Um, the home working model allows for up to 40% of your time to actually be worked on site. Um, and also our rotors have got every Friday will be a collaborative day. So say a, um, a member of staff want, needs to work um, with their manager or with a team member on perhaps a report or a piece of work, there will be the ability to come and do collaboration. We, um, but we will be talking to people on individual basis if they say that they don't want to work at home at all. That's what the consultation's about. Just have another quick question that suddenly popped into my head. Um, what if we've got people, members of staff, who haven't got access at the moment to broadband or anything like that? Are we going to, is TBC going to fund that? The home working allowance uh, is what right. will contribute to um, equipment or broadband. Um, that's, that's the idea of the home working allowance. But everybody who is home working at the moment has access. So that will apply to, that £26 will cover utilities and things yeah. like that? Yeah. Okay. And how's that been worked out? Um, through negotiation with the trade unions and HMRC guidance. Okay. Any more questions? Councillor Wade. Thank you, Chair. I've been working from this smart data for the last two years, is it, since the pandemic? Are you getting better results, or are the results the same from when we had the front desk, like on to uh, on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, we've seen um, changes in interactions, um, and um, increases in some areas, um, and decreases in other areas. But we didn't have a massive increase in phone calls as a result to the front front desk, but um, with the head of customer experience is constantly looking at processes and seeing how we can better benefit customers by improving it so um we we have been they have been very busy um but i haven't got any i haven't got any data to hand tonight in terms of that but i can i can do uh, bring that at another time i'll just bring tina in Th th thank you, Chair. Just to support what Zoe said, when we took the first Cabinet report on the Recovery and Reset Agenda back in October 2020, one of the appendices there did point to um, the level of transformation that teams you know, had had to adapt to during the pandemic um, and pointed to increases in productivity across some of our, our functional areas. Um, for example, you know, you will have known in, in, in some of our teams they've had to administer, you know, increases in benefit grant funding, for instance, and have still managed to do that as well as do the normal operational activity. You know, you know my background in terms of housing related and homelessness services. We've actually reduced our homelessness presentations despite interacting with customers in a very different way. Um, so there have been successes. I think the key is that during the pandemic that's been accepted because obviously we've been in lockdowns and we've been in unprecedented situations. I think one of the projects within the recovery and reset agenda around service redesign, which I'm going to be talking to corporate scrutiny about next week, is about looking at that level of transformation and what's likely to be sustained as we you know, we revert to the new normal, for want of a better expression. But certainly, some of that cabinet intelligence from October will put will answer some of those questions if you're interested in that data, Councillor Wade. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Tina. Councillor Harper. Yeah, it's uh, very fascinating to hear what you've been saying. Um, for someone of my generation, which is probably not considerably on from yours. Um, it's astonishing, this, uh, this social change that's happening. Um, and for, certainly from my point, uh, perspective, it's a very worrying one. Uh, people are now rarely leaving their homes. We don't 
go out to the pubs and the clubs as we used to because we can get our supermarket uh, rituals. Uh, we can have our groceries delivered home. Now we're not leaving home to go to work. When do we leave home? When do we ever meet other people? When do we see each other? It's a very, very immen immensely um, difficult uh, step to take, I think, socially for for the country as a whole. And I know all the civil servants are uh, currently refusing to go back to the office because they've all bought their nice cottages in the Cotswolds and they're very happy working from there. I can't blame them if they can get away with it, yeah. But it's um, one of the most important things, I think, in a working environment is working and interacting with your colleagues. That's, to me, my background is journalism. You can't, in my book, be a journalist uh, working from home. You need to talk to other people. You need to speak to other people. You need to have people who are more experienced than you spotting what you're doing and telling you, you know, how to progress and what you need to do. I find this, this shift to working from home absolutely wrought with, with danger. And um, however attractive it may be to some people, I'm not sure that it's the way we should be going and that we should perhaps be encouraging everyone to get back to um, a shared environment. Um, that's only my own personal opinion, but I'm sure many other people have different views. And um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I possibly am alone. Yeah. But I think that I ought to raise the issue because I think it's, I think it's dangerous. But uh, I don't know what others think. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Harper. Uh, just before bringing Councillor People, th there's a question from Councillor Maycock that I think relates to this. Um, in relation to mental health and stress, what have been the impact on staff illnesses during the smart working? And have you any data for that? I haven't got it with me today. Our absence has um, gone down um, through, th through the pandemic. Um, but in terms of reasons for absence, we do have some um, uh, staff who are, are not uh, who have been off through stress, etc. But that's with um, I'm not sure I could attribute that to smart working though. It's uh, uh, some of that's been around anxieties around the uh, around the pandemic itself, as opposed to the working environment maybe. Um, but yet yeah, we have had a reduction in absence through the pandemic. Would it be okay me for me to address uh, Councillor Harper's point? Of course, points? Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the th um, I, I hear what, um, what you're saying in terms of um, people not leaving the house, etc. But in terms of our encouragement of staff to be talking to each other, we've got lot. We've put lots of mechanisms in place throughout the pandemic. We've had, um, you know, t uh, maybe a team coffee morning. We've made sure that everybody's been having touch points. We we've um, We've encu we encourage um, everybody to have a one-to-one -one on a weekly basis so that even though that would be through teams, um, for the future plans, we have built, built in the collaboration days and um, hot desk and touchdown um, points will be included. And we are going to be um, working with managers to um, ensure that they, they address some of these issues um, about... I, I hear what you're saying about younger, younger staff and learning from that collaboration. Whilst we'll have our collaboration days, we'll also be encouraging managers to look at other ways of ensuring that they're bringing and um, you know, bringing those young, younger staff on to actually for our succession planning. We actually um, have a corporate project for the for an organisational development strategy, and that can, those considerations are being made in that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Zoe. Yes, I, I hear what you say, and I'm sure you've gone to incredible lengths to try and, uh, and, and, and bridge these gaps. But I personally don't think anything works better than sitting next to someone and someone saying, what do you think about this? I don't know what to do about this. That, to me, is is proper working relationship, but maybe I'm old-fashioned, who knows? to comment I agree to a certain extent however you can do that by having a team conference or picking up the telephone um, you don't necessarily have to be I don't think sitting next to somebody um, councillor people and then councillor way uh, 
Uh, first of all, Chair, um, I think the expression is we are where we are, and can I remind councillors that this was agreed in council? So this is this is what we what we all agreed to. Um, it, it's a bit too late to turn around and say, well, I don't think it's a very good idea. Um, but my question, two things actually, if I may. The first one is, it's actually a completely different um, way of working for managers as well. Having been in an environment and been a manager in academia, where there is an expectation that staff work from home, you have to manage by outcomes. There's no way that you can check up on people. They're not in front of you, you can't see what they're doing. And I think that's a bit of a, mind, a mindset shift for managers. So that's something that I'm sure you've got in mind and that you've got training in place for. Um, but no doubt you want to comment. The second thing, I the second question is a very specific one. Um, when you can't see people, when they're not in front of you all the time and you don't know what they're doing, one of the ways of, of I guess, managing them is to set protocols for things like interaction. Correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think we have protocols in place at the moment for things like how quickly emails are supposed to be answered. And I know one of the councillors referred earlier to the time it takes for us to get responses. Um, do we have protocols in place in terms of responding to members of the public? And if we don't, should we? And if we do, what are they? Thank you. Okay, um, I'll take the question uh, about managers and the different way of working. Yes, of course, the um, part of the support packages for managers and the organisation development strategy will include um, the different ways of working and how they can be managing by outcomes, exactly as, as you've said. In terms of the email protocols, um, CMT very much do encourage, and through, um, through the pandemic, we've put things out on the communications about we don't expect you to um, re reply to an email within seconds and, th and that kind of thing, because it is recognised that people, th there is that perception, isn't there, about working from home and, um, you know, people are absolutely fine to go out and, uh, you know, take a lunch break. So um, in terms of that, we have um, done some encouragement, but part of our um, organisational development um, strategy will include further detail on that. Um, and I apologise, I've, I've lost my train of thought on the second thing I was going to say. But, yeah, it, it is in our, our thoughts. Thank you. Tina. Tina. Chair, can I, I just um, sort of support that as well and, and come back to councillor people on that um, particular point? Because it's absolutely right. The decision around um, decommissioning Marmion and smart working being an enabling for that was taken uh, due, uh, the 29th of July Cabinet and the 25th of August uh, full council um, subject to all those consultative processes um, and that was predicated on two key things really one that even pre-Covid um, this building was largely under occupied not used and would require considerable investment going forward so it was recognised that to work in a smarter more management by outcome focused way based on the right location for the right business objective would enable us um, to make those business efficiencies across our asset stock rather than, dare we say, it meet some of those efficiencies through services or savings or, or, or jobs longer term. So, you know, we have to remember that that was a key primary driver for that. And that package of savings was around three and a half million, which the implementation of this and the delivery of this uh, relies on if we're going to achieve that. The second thing, of course, is, you know, smart working, whilst, you know, um, it's fair to say, and, and Zoe will, will know better than I from all the research, but we are very much at the vanguard of this in terms of working in this way. And we've been pioneers probably in paving the way to work like this when a lot of other organisations are still grappling with, you know, how they can work smarter and more agile. And I think the things you raise, Councillor Harper and Councillor Greatrix, uh, are absolutely right, but there are, they are obstacles to overcome rather than barriers to not do it. And certainly as a council, we have tried and will continue through the organisational development strategy to put things in place to protect people's health and wellbeing. You know, I have 
daily calls on Teams, which is that simulation of that office environment. Um, people have referred to the water cooler conversations, haven't they, which are invaluable. We try and facilitate those through our technological uh, ways of dealing with it. And I think there will be a very different management skill set going forward that will be picked up as part of that organisational development and investment. Um, so from our point of view, we recognise what you're saying. There's no disagreement with that. Um, but actually, that's about the organisation and the stakeholders' ability to foster and build trust and confidence across our employment network to deliver um, on key performance indicators that people are assessed against, you know, rather than clock watching, which can also sometimes be an uh, impediment to effective service delivery. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Tina. I'm not passing love letters to Councillor Maycock. <laughs> He's writing down his questions. Councillor Graychex. Could I ask possibly a contentious question? Is COVID a very convenient vehicle then um, by which we can test working from home and say we've got to? It's been a fantastic success, therefore it's going to be set in place forevermore. I think what COVID has certainly done, and, s and, and depending on which research you point to, it's probably accelerated that digital agenda by, you know, some say five years, some say ten years. So there's no doubt that the pandemic has, has provided that opportunity to test new ways of working that we probably wouldn't have done without it, and certainly accelerated it. Um, whether it's been the cause for us to change smart working, I would say it isn't. What we have been able to say is that by better use of our building assets through smarter ways of working and enjoying the levels of transformation that we have, um, we can make sure that we're, you know, we've got a one council approach, we're fit for the future, and we can invest in, and deliver on our wider corporate ambitions. So when we talk about place shaping, regeneration, you know, service sustainability and growth, surely if this is an opportunity to be more efficient in this way, that allows us to invest there. So it's about a council that's fit for the future, I would say, Councillor Greatrex. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. I'm going to bring um, Zoe back in, but I think we just all have to remember as well that all your managers are staff as well. And, you know, it's important that we look at your well-being as well. So, Zoe. Thank you. It was just to build on um, what Tina said, um, just to emphasise that we were working in um, a flexible way before the pandemic and that was an enabler for us to actually get our staff working at home so quickly because many many staff were working at home albeit maybe one day a week um, we ha I think we had quite not many ma many that would just be in the office five days a week so um, whilst I appreciate what you've said about COVID but um, um, t as Tina said it was the accelerator um, and we were doing it anyway and how to um, build on Tina's comments about us being vanguard and pioneers. We are often, um, with our trade unions, will um, often be um, hailed as the, the forefront of moving things forward and they will ask us to speak to other local authorities um, to tell them how we're doing things. And I've had many, many um, other local authorities on our um, West Midlands regional calls saying, we're so far behind, you know, you're so far in front. We're only just trying to work out what we're doing. You're consulting with your staff to actually move it forward. So we we are at the forefront of, of the movement. Thank you for that, Zoe. Um, Councillor Maycock has got another question, I think. No, you've scrubbed that one out. <laughs> OK, so um, moving on to the third sector. <laughs> You're up, Joe. Oh, Councillor Wade, yes. Then we'll move to um, uh, to office. Thanks, Chair. Just one more. As as moving forward, obviously we're going to go into digital. Just one question: Is there anything that us councillors can do to help assist in moving forward with this smart working thing, or is it just learn as we go or whatever? Well, um, as the technology improves always, 
um, ways of working may change. And I know that um, Gareth, uh, 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 ICT, Gareth, um, head of ICT, Gareth uh, Yolden, is looking at um, m um, using different ways of working to actually improve uh, both councillors and officers' um, experiences, um, trying to move things to, uh, more to the cloud. Um, councillors may have seen the ICT strategy that was approved last year. So all of the detail about that kind of that side of it, the digitisation, is within the ICT strategy, and Gareth's um, um, moving on quite at pace with that. Thank you. Joe. Thank you, councillors. Um, I think we'll start obviously with the with the vulnerability, um, the third sector and vulnerability strategy. Um, obviously, this has has been accelerated definitely again through through COVID, and I think the work with the, with the uh, um, voluntary sector is still very much ongoing with the pandemic, even though we are coming out the other end. So with that in mind, uh, the, the, the project, a lot of the things that are on there now are ongoing and also very much linked with our customer services offer. Um, at the beginning um, of the pandemic, I think sort of two, three months in, we commissioned a survey or a, um, a piece of work around looking at vulnerability um, and what we as a council are have direct impact on so you know what we our services have direct impact on and what other things affect people's vulnerability that was largely based on the covid19 vulnerability strand so there's there's, there's quite a, obviously quite a lot of those people that may be affected by covid um, obviously you got your clinically extremely vulnerable for which the services were mobilized through our voluntary sector to 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 deliver uh, those food parcels and make sure people were okay um, the, those vulnerability streams we've continued to look at. So we have age determinant, we have the financial and wellbeing um, determinants, the mental health, the access to our homelessness services and people in our housing services, people that may be in debt to us through either council tax or other means, rent, housing rent, um, people who live in poor conditions um, through the private sector housing. Um, those are very much people as well that were identified through that, that the pandemic and the work um, of the voluntary sector, um, actually identifying people in Tamworth who were not known to services, didn't just didn't actually consider themselves to be vulnerable. Um, you know, I can take an example of old, uh, an old man who lived in a, a private sector housing. He went to the cafe every afternoon for his tea, and that's how he fed himself. It wasn't until those services were actually withdrawn that we could do anything or look at him and he, he came to, 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 to our attention. And what we then looked at through that vulnerability is what as a council are we responsible for or can we directly affect through their vulnerability or how can we work in partnership moving forward to actually make sure you've got that, as, as Upcar said, that wraparound service that we may not deliver but we can actually influence or actually commission or actually look to our partners to commission. So those vulnerabilities on the, the baseline service, we've, we've kind of concentrated with Zoe and her team around those people who may be digitally excluded for any reason. So that certainly would affect our services if we are looking at that 100% digital enabled services to our customers. We're looking at the financial vulnerabilities because obviously we have responsibility through that financial vulnerability around those on delivering benefits, delivering housing, and also those people who obviously I've got to pay council tax. We're looking at those homelessness and isolation that, that came out as a key theme, and these were identified through cross-working within our council colleagues. Mental health and the emerging mental health issues as a result of the pandemic. So we've got sort of key themes that we, we've been looking at. Um, that vulnerability will continue to be worked on as a sort of a holistic program. We also look into model the vulnerability service in conjunction with customer services, as Zoe outlined. So we're looking at that ongoing activity linked to the smart working and the customer services officers. We continue to have that work with the customer services teams. Zoe outlined the fact that at the beginning of the pandemic, um, we had the befriending service, or actually at that point, it was a help service for those who were actually isolating. That has been continued. And obviously, as Zoe said, there's a lot of work with the, with the team at Community Together CIC um, to look at what people are ringing for and how those services can be signposted. Um, 
that will in turn lead to us to look at our our commissioning framework with with the voluntary sector what does that look like to sort of maximize that social value we are actually working with our heads of service um, to look at what their services use this, the voluntary sector for or how they work with the voluntary sector and how we work in partnership we've identified quite a lot of partnerships um, within the teams that, that actually we draw on quite a lot of uh, as councillor wade mentioned once we we look we, we draw on and we are looking at the help that the community can give to actually not just assist with our services but again that holistic approach so we are looking at the developing work about picking up the vulnerable groups and identifying them who they are um, and actually then that will then inform our approach we want we want to be able to have a strategy or a process and approach that says this is how Tamworthborough Council works and engages with our voluntary sector um, ac across our communities what we offer what what they can offer and what our partners can offer as as Upkar said that's very important around the mental health although they are the health provider they're not necessarily the ones in the communities that need to be delivering that service and we're also then looking at unlocking, lo unlocking the potential across the voluntary sector you know what do we know about the voluntary, the voluntary sector and what services can be offered bringing it together looking at our grants and commissioning processes we've already um, reviewed and looked at our community grants uh, in a sense there are things that we can maybe look at moving forward so although my um, sheet sort of says it's ongoing it is ongoing a lot of it is a day-to-day -day work as I said the ongoing pandemic in the in the beginning we'd like to adopt um, a voluntary sector pledge um, support Staffordshire who as I say are the main sort of broker for looking after the voluntary sector across Staffordshire um, have a voluntary sector pledge that they would like all councils to sort of look at how they recognise the voluntary sector, how the voluntary sector can have a voice, how we use their social value within our commissioning. So that will be the first step in recognising the importance of working with the voluntary sector. Um, I'm currently talking with the portfolio um, to put that onto cabinet as a first stage action that we can adopt that approach. But the work is ongoing um, and obviously at, at some some point in the future when we've actually mapped those services mapped what we do as a council for those vulnerable and mapped how we can work and look at with our partnerships that we have then hopefully that will provide that well-being i guess that we want to look at across the, across the town and how we actually engage and look at that and that's a whistle stop to her. <laughs> Thanks, Joan. I think that answers the question that Councillor Maycock put, um, put before. Yeah, and yeah, I just think it's vitally important that we that we have conversations with the third parties and the voluntary sector. Um, yeah. Um, questions. Just no questions everybody to silence. <laughs> No questions, no comments. Okay. Um, can I just go back slightly to, to Zoe? Just one question that I, I've got written down, but I forgot to ask you. So if I can just ask you this question. Um, it talks about agency staff in the, the report and the, the risks and what have you. Has, has, is that currently budgeted? Do we know if we're going to need any agency staff? So the, um, the agency staff was to support the um, HR team yes. to do the consultations. Right, okay. as, as it stands, we, we, we went out to recruitment. We couldn't recruit because it was, it was a temporary position. Mm -hmm. And at that time, um, we, we just weren't getting, not just about um, in HR, but in, in some other areas, we weren't getting applicants for physicians. So what we um, did is... Um, have got an agency that could provide backup if we need it however the team are actually managing it and um through uh, through over time okay. um because and also that's that says a lot about the team as well because they they want to manage the whole process uh, rather than hand it off so but they, they are managing it within within time with a little bit of overtime it's not an excessive amount and of i overtime. suppose yeah following on from that it's probably better to have the in-house staff doing the face-to-face because they probably have more yeah 
more knowledge of the, the stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. And they, they've um, been instrumental in developing um, the, the actual model as well, so they know it when the questions come. Mm instead of the questions going outside of the meeting and then having to come um, mm. uh, go back to the person they can answer a lot of the questions within the meeting so there okay. is the benefit to okay. that Lovely. Thank, thank you, you. councillor way thanks chair going back to joe is he what's the problem Yeah. What's the what what is the protocol around homelessness? <laughs> Only I, I I had somebody contact me. But as a counsellor I don't know the actual protocol of of around the, the homelessness. I, you know what I mean? I know there's a specific thing for them to be homeless. Yeah. But how do they get to that point? Tina, I think I may have to defer to Tina on that one. <laughs> Um, might it, sorry, might it be worth having a conversation? I was going to suggest that. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm and Tina can yeah. can go over it fully then. Yeah. 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 Of course, we, we, I'll pick up with you, Councillor Wade, separately. I mean, it, it, the, it, they are a client group within the vulnerability mm -hmm. project that's being picked up on. But in my, you know, substantive portfolio around neighbourhoods, we can have a chat about. You happy with that, Councillor Wayne? Oh, yeah. OK, so I think we've just got the one recommendation. Is that a wording for it? Right, the recommendation has been slightly altered, <laughs> but only so that it may... It, 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 it clarifies exactly what we're asking for. So, Cabinet consider another location other than that of the assembly rooms, but interim front of house customer services. Is that, does that cover your recommendation? It is, but I think um, we ought to have something in there about the urgency with this, with which this needs to be looked at and hopefully implemented because uh, certainly I know from personal experience the current situation is not is not working terribly well so it's um it's speed really that we need to look at and uh, urge the cabinet to move okay. as quickly as they can sorry yeah as quickly as they can at the end yeah yeah okay have you got that tracer okay so cabinet or perhaps another just yeah. with urgency um, well, okay. so something along that line, yeah. Cabinet consider another location other than that of the assembly rooms for interim front of house customer services as, as quickly as possible, I would say. Well, it's going to be. We're talking about semantics, really, but. It's going to be your recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's absolutely fine by me, Chair. Okay. All right, so that's the recommendation. Have we got a seconder for that? Councillor Grey checks. All in favour? So that recommendation is carried. Back to the agenda. Right. Up, up. Just bear with me for a second. Well, we have a second recommendation, okay, on smart working. Um, recommendation that Cabinet consider to hold conversations with senior officers to formulate memorandum of understanding in timeline to reply to emails, officers, to members and members of officers, members to officers. Because I think that covers something that somebody brought up earlier. Yes, okay. J just on that particular point, I mean, obviously the recommendations are around um, adding value to the recovery and reset programme. If I may, that recommendation seems to be around 
our sort of wider customer service strategy in terms of our response to whether that's compliance or compliments mm -hmm. or email traffic. Um, you know, I'm not suggesting that recommendation isn't made, but it probably, if it is made, it would be picked up as part of that wider customer services strategy. And and in terms of the first recommendation that you made, in terms of as soon as possible, if it might help, just to remind you, we're going back to Cabinet on the 7th of April. So, yes, there will be inevitable discussions with the relevant mm -hmm. portfolio holders between now and then. Um, but obviously, at that Cabinet juncture, we'll be talking about recommendations and decisions from April 2022 onwards. So, you know, it's just for you to probably clarify what you mean by as soon as possible. Because if you're saying as a committee, you want Cabinet to consider withdrawing those triage arrangements before April 2022, when we go to Cabinet, then, you, then that perhaps needs some clarity, if I may, Chair. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so we'll take John's then. We'll take your recommendation. Um, should we clarify? Yeah, I think we need to put a date on it, really, don't we? I can't hear you. Right, okay. Okay, so okay, <laughs> so I'll okay, so make a, can we? Um, yes, I need to make an amendment to that. So I've not done this before. So <laughs> okay, so I need to. Neither have I, chair. No. Okay. Um, a motion. We need to pass a motion that uh, we amend the previous recommendation. And word it uh, differently so cabinet consider another location other than that of the assembly rooms for interim front of house customer services before should be explored and implemented um as a matter of um yeah yeah um, have we got a suggestion from the officers on this particular point? Um, Chair, if I may, uh, I'm, we just need to be clear what we're talking to the portfolio holder about. I mean, if it's something that you know you want to pick up with the portfolio holder as a scrutiny committee, it's just that the decision-making point around mm. what's going to happen um, post-April will be on the 7th of April, Cabinet decision. If what you're saying is you know, you've got strong objections to those arrangements continuing from now until April, then it's probably just recording that so us as officers can pick that up with the portfolio holder or you can. Right, okay, Council of People. Thank you, Chair. I think the um, recommendation as it stands is acceptable. It's a matter of communication with the portfolio holder so that uh, pros prospective alternative arrangements can be considered. So I, I, my personal thought is to leave it as it is, as agreed and as voted on, um, but have some conversations with the relevant people. Okay. I think that would work. Yeah, absolutely. It is just clarity, so we're clear on the message okay. going back, not necessarily the wording of your recommendation, because as councillor people said, that's okay. Okay, absolutely. Thank you for that, councillor people. Are we okay with that then, Tracy? Yeah. yeah. So we're going to take the recommendation as it was originally, and we voted on that, so yeah. that recommendation is carried. Okay, All right, thank you, now we've sorted that one. Um, I think we move on to item six. So if um, Zoe, Joe, and Tina would like to, again, you're quite welcome to stay if you want to. Chair, just as a, as a quick point of order, I think there was a recommendation made which it was felt wasn't appropriate for this committee, which was about response times to mm -hmm. from officers to members. I do think that's something that we do need to pick up, and I'm not quite sure what the appropriate forum is, but perhaps we could task you with um, with finding and, and using the appropriate forum for that, because okay. I think it is a matter of concern. Yeah, OK. Where was that? Thank you, Joe.
So now we move on to item six, which is open spaces and outdoor leisure update. Um, we have Sarah McGrangle here, so just hand over to Sarah. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, councillors. Um, and thank you for the invite back to update on what I previously presented to you. Um, I've got three areas to update on. Um, the first being the leisure services tenders that we had failed to receive any returns when I last came to committee. Um, we contacted the eight companies who'd expressed an interest with us to ascertain why they hadn't submitted any returns. Um, and we had a range of comments from nothing right the way through to the text box for them to put their wording in wasn't big enough <coughs> to the time frame didn't work and varying things along the way. So we took on board all of the comments. We amended the text box. We changed the time frame. We updated the, the project implementation documentation um, <coughs> and the project plan. And we went back out to tender. And we are currently in negotiations with one company, which hopefully by the middle of February, I will be able to say to you, yes, we have now secured the deal. But that is an ongoing discussion at the moment, but it's looking very favorable. So we do seem to have solved that one. And that is for the uh, plain pitches assessment, the open spaces um, assessment, and the indoor and outdoor sports pitches feasibility study. All the pieces of work that planning need to take us forward for the future. So that's my update on that. I was also asked to give you an update on the Council's um, proposals to celebrate the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. And this is a provisional list of things that we're doing, and it's likely to change, move, expand a little bit. But the basis of this are that on we will start the celebrations on the additional bank holiday, which is the 2nd of June, with the beacon lighting, and we will be joining in the national beacon lighting event. We're a little uncertain at the moment as to what that is actually going to um, entail, because I personally would like to light a fire on top of the castle, but I don't think I'm going to be allowed to. So we may be illuminating it in some other way. <laughs> but there will be a beacon of some sorts um, celebrating that. So that's on Thursday the 2nd. We then move into the 3rd and the 4th, and we are planning, uh, the Arts and Events team are planning the Queen's Platinum Jubilee celebration called the Platinum Path, which follows the Queen through the eight decades of her reign. Um, it will be based in the castle grounds. It will be a free event. There will be eight different stations set up with walking characters, uh, you know, right from her coronation, right the way through, all the things she's done along her way. The castle will work with us. We will have displays and varying other things for the public to come along and reflect. Um, and we will also be working with some of our historical partners, you know, that they how they can bring all this together. So that's in planning at the moment. So that's the third and the fourth. On the fourth, we also actually have a wedding at the castle. So the, the people who are getting married at the castle are going to be midst all of this. So they're going to be in for a fun day. And on the Sunday the 5th, we are going to um, join in with the big lunch, which is the national, you know, national call for everyone to come and have lunch with the Queen. Um, we are facilitating through the arts and events team, street parties that you know, many of the community will want to do, but we will also be putting on a big lunch in the castle grounds where you can either bring your own picnic or you can come along and potentially purchase a picnic from us ending with some type of proms event at the end of the afternoon. So that is the proposed plan for that. Um, running alongside that, um, Tamworth in bloom. We're back in bloom for the first time post-pandemic this year. And the floral displays will be supporting both the Queen's Jubilee and the Commonwealth Games and everything in between, as it normally does. But hopefully we'll be bigger and better than ever. The judging for that is on the 12th of July, so everything will be in place for the Jubilee. Further, to further support the actual weekend of the Jubilee celebrations, the Assembly Rooms has three shows booked. My bit's really nice tonight. <laughs> we have a Right Royal Knees Up, which is a comedy show for the, for the, for the Queen. We have um, a Queen Tribute Act, and we have a children's show based on the best-selling children's book, The Queen's Knickers. So we have those events all on sale currently at the Assembly Rooms to also support that weekend. 
So that should be quite a nice weekend. The other thing I have also tried to ascertain, and I have asked uh, Democratic Services to do this, is to contact out um, across the county to see what civic functions are proposed. At the moment, we're not aware of anything. We have already asked the question because I would like to make sure that we don't block any timeline for you know any events that we can support. You know, the council can support, or vice versa, they can support us with their events, but. Uh, I understand Democratic Services is going to ask the question again because I can't believe there's going to be nothing, you know, coming out from you know, Lord Lieutenant or the High Sheriff's Office that there'll be nothing at all. But at the moment, we're not aware of anything. So that is that. Um, I don't think there's anything else on that one. That is very much provisional. I mean, there are other events at the ca the castle are bidding for funding. We're all bidding, bid, bidding for funding. There's lots of little funding pots to support this. But the, the events that we will put on will be free events in the castle grounds for the public to come and join in with us. So it's provisional. We may change, may move around a bit. We may add some more to it. Probably will. Normally do. Um, so before I move on to the third thing, are there any questions on either of those two items? Councillor Groucher. Just to pour a bit of doom and gloom on the situation, heavens forbid that anything should happen to our dear Queen between now and then. But if you've already got things in place, like you say, a Queen Tribute Act, um, how are we going to unhinge ourselves from all the things that have been provisionally arranged? And what will be the Council's attitude if that event does sadly happen? Well, the events, the assembly rooms are all, you know, they're acts that we would book anyway. They're just centred around that weekend. So unless, you know, the, the Queen should leave us that can weekend. I, can I just interrupt? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there is a protocol in place, isn't there? There is for, very much for, a protocol. For those types yeah. of events, uh, for those... For as, around our yes. other events, but... No, there's a protocol for those type of things happening with the royal family, so I don't... I'm not sure that that really yeah. is. Yeah, but in general, so say like when um, Duke and Edinburgh died, but if, if this huge celebration is going on, this is quite a unique event in itself. Can I, can I suggest that I have a chat with you after, okay. after okay. the meeting about okay. that one? Okay. But obviously, uh, unless it was that weekend, things will be amended accordingly. But if it is that weekend, then there is, as Councillor Claymore points out there is a whole protocol that we have to follow for you know the death of a royal was that who else had got the hand up was it councillor Wayne? no councillor harper only <laughs> just a very simple point but um everything everything and everything will depend on the weather absolutely if you remember the golden jubilee they had that fantastic flotilla going up the thames in the most abysmal weather that we've we've it was a hooli that we haven't seen in goodness knows how long and it went ahead and it was awful and people were struggling to smile at all of that so whatever we do it will all depend on the weather so just keep everything crossed for a really really fabulous weekend absolutely can i can i say that i think it's going to be a fantastic weekend there's lots of things there, and I'm sure we'll get lots of snickers, snickers from children when they go and see the Queen's knickers. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's fantastic, um, fantastic provisional programme. So, um, yeah, if you'd like to move on, Sarah. Thank you. And then the third item I wanted to update you on was um, I'm into community woodland, um, which is, for those of the, you who may not be aware, it is a large piece of open space, soon to be... Um, actually built into the nature park that's formed part of the former golf course. Um, I have just, if, in case anybody doesn't know where it is, it's at the southern end of what was the golf course, uh, where the driving range was previously, and the, the Amington Depot, as is, is here. So it's along that sort of eastern side on the border with Warwickshire. And it was part of the um, planned proposals when the golf course was sold and the housing development's gone on that we would have an area of open space on the east of Tamworth and it was going to be called Amington Community Woodland. 
Um, it's all funded through Section 106 monies, and it originally went to Cabinet in February 19. Um, we should have actually started work on it more so than we have, but obviously we had a pandemic, which is why I took a report to Cabinet last week, just refreshing the timeline and refreshing the funding and just you know, bringing it all up to speed and getting all the approvals. Obviously, portfolios have changed, etc. Making sure we've got all the right governance in place before we go out to tender. We've currently got a um, landscape architect on board who has done us a, a design for the area, uh, which it's a very natural design. Um, it's not your formal park, as you would see it. Again, this is an artist's impression of one of the areas there. It's designed to be a very natural to blend in with the environment and to complement the existing Hodge Lane Nature Reserve, which is at the north of the site. And there's also the proposed extension with Hodge Lane to extend into the site once the builders have departed. So it's really just to, to come along and say to you that, you know, that's all been approved. We're now moving ahead with that. We're looking the next 18 months uh, to two years to have that built on site uh, as a, a new point of um, access and accessibility and open space, new open space for members of the public. Um, and one of the other things in the report that went to Cabinet, I will just point out, we proposed a name change because it's always been known as Amington Community Woodland and it's the most unwoodland place you've ever seen. There isn't any woodland there, there never will be. It's not the type of landscape. Well, there will be trees, but it won't be a woodland. So we proposed a change which was accepted that we're calling it Amington Nature Park. So, but it will be have a country park feel rather than somewhere like the Castle Grounds or even Dostal, which is more manicured and, you know, it will be that natural look. And we've already, we're working with the Staffordshire Wildlife Trust, we've already put boards out for residents so they can see what type of um, aesthetic look they will have to the area so we don't raise the expectation that they're going to have it manicured and planted daffodils and pansies because that's not going to happen it's going to be you know a more back to nature na native species complementing what we have with a nature reserve at the top of the site thank you thank you sarah and i think we will welcome any open space that we've got to be uh, enhanced um councillor harper just very, very, very quickly. Um, that's all very good. Uh, the wood. I, I beep on. I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't saying anything about the wood as such. I, I'm not sure it is. The only thing I, I would suggest is um, the names. Everything is in a name. In, in, in I think um, the Beatles wouldn't have been half as successful if they'd been called the Creepy Crawlies or something. It's everything is a name. An Amington wood. It's a wood, and it's in Amington. It's not terribly if it was called florendine florendine he was a big man from um, history there's a florendine street and so forth named after some local amington personality or something it would give the whole thing a lot more personality and a lot more local uh, feeling um uh that's my own particular view on it amington wood doesn't really inspire too much but there you go <laughs> we've lost the wood bit now anyway <laughs> <laughs> all right certainly the community would com the word community in anything is a killer isn't it the fire station the tamworth mercia community fire station we know it's a community because that's what this is mm. it's just stating the obvious um i think perhaps we ought to um look at when we name things use a bit more imagination i think uh Generally, it's um, to be fair. I do idea. think the community wooden was a working title right at the beginning of yeah. the negotiation, yeah. so it was it was due a, a change. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair. Councillor Wade. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, no, the 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 woodland. Oh, I'm saying woodlands now. No, the Hamilton Fields. I say. What kind of trees and, and stuff we has actually been? discussed or as, as they've been discussed because i'm a good passionate believer that we should start growing planting in open spaces apple trees pear trees plum trees damsons so people can go with a family pick the fruit go home make a chutney or porridge or whatever they want to do and i'm a strong believer in that 
can you incorporate fruit trees in, uh, and in 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 that woodland part? Absolutely, that's already been discussed. Um, you may or may not be aware of the Wild About Tamworth project, which is a partnership that we have with the Staffordshire Wildlife Trust, where they work on all of our nature reserves with us. We're working very closely with them in developing not only what the landscape looks like, but the future use of it and how the community can do that. Part of the consultation prior to the pandemic, um, we went out and spoke to a lot of the community about, you know, would anybody like to be volunteers and work on that site as we've had, you know, on Hodge Lane and Dostal and all the other LNRs. And we have quite a long list of people who, who want to do that. And the intention is that um, the plan we have will create the basic framework. It will put the bas basic infrastructure in, the paths will be in, you know, the topography will be built. And then we will work with the community and different groups that they come in they plant the trees, they plant the fruit trees, and they watch them grow to fruition. And exactly what you're, you're saying, you know, it is their area for them to use. Um, you know, it, and it may be that some groups want to plant fruit trees, other plants want to do other things, other groups want to do other things. So yes, th you know, through the partnership that we have through World About Tamworth, we will work with the groups and the community to do exactly that, yes. Thank you, Sarah. That's good to hear. Councillor Pupil. Thanks, Chair. I think I might be the only Ammington resident here. So on behalf of Ammington residents, I'd like to say we're really looking forward to this. Um, I don't really care what it's called. <laughs> um, hopefully I'll be able to take my dogs. Um, my question, though, is have we got funding for maintenance? Is that part of the Section 106? Because one of the issues that we've got in Tamworth is that we have an awful lot of trees, but we don't have enough money to maintain them. Um, and sometimes I think residents get quite frustrated because certainly street trees can cause all sorts of problems and there's not always the funding to keep on top of them as we'd like to. So have we got the funding to maintain Ammington Nature Park? Okay, thank you. Yes, the Section 106 has negotiated were for the creation and maintenance of said areas and um, as, as it was at the time we could only negotiate for a 10 year period which we did and we have a considerable sum £200,000 in reserves for maintenance for the first 10 years of the, of the actual woodland. The rest of the site is subject to a different section 106 agreement but all of them now come with full maintenance. The only caveat I would say that with the advent of Brexit supply chain and material costs, whether we have actually got enough money now because these were negotiated five, six years ago. So, you know, that is possibly an issue going forward, but it's an issue, you know, that the whole country, you know, has to look at. But yes, absolutely calculated with maintenance. Thank you, Thank you Sarah. Any more questions or comments? Well, yes, <laughs> I think, um, yeah, I think, like I say, any new open space is going to be brilliant, you know, and I, I don't really care what you call it either, to be fair, <laughs> as long as people know it's there, that's the main thing, and people make use of it, so, so thank you for your report, and um, yes. Thank you. I just will add that in the actual crux of the, this isn't in the woodland, but in the crux of the development right near the local centre, there is a very large um, play area as well, new play area facility that we will be, uh, that will be being built. And is, did you say that's within that open space? No, it's not no, within it's the separate. community. Um, no, I'm doing it now. It's not within Ammington Nature Park, okay. but um, it is up... Um, Central's around e Eagle Drive, which was, you know, the, yes. the turning point there. It's not far from there in the local centre within the actual built development. There is a large play area there and there will also be some natural play put into the extension to the LNR at the top as well. Right. Could, could I just then ask that we make, um, we have a look and consider putting some play things in for disabled Oh, children? it will be. It's yeah. fully inclusive, okay. yes. We're in negotiations with Redrow. They have to build that. Okay. We then take it after they've built it. So we are working with them to ensure that it's fully inclusive, yes. Okay, so thank you. So I think we...
happy to accept that report and move on to the next thing if you'd like to depart. <laughs> Sorry, apologies. Uh, move a motion where we can extend the meeting because I think Paul's report is quite extensive. Um, so, are we all in favour of that? Second, yeah. How, how long are you proposing to extend it to? Should we say nine o'clock? All in favour? Thank you. So now move on to update from the chair. Um, so I'm just reading my own notes. <laughs> um, just to say, Dan and I attended um, a two-day course. It was an online course for effective scrutiny um, a couple of weeks ago now. Um, there was a lot of good practice that came out of that, a lot of sharing of good practice. Um, if, if anybody would like to um, have any more information on that, if they ask myself or Dan, we can pass on some of the, the slides and the information to you. It was extremely useful in bringing out ways of trying to focus on items that you know, were really relevant. So, so that was the one. Um, I think that's all I've got, actually. Oh, there's an email as well about the Health and Wellbeing Board strategy consultation. I don't know whether you've all seen that. Um, I did email something out today, but it may have come in after that. So um, I'll be sending something out on that as well. So we move on to item eight. Responses to reports of the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee. Um, Councillor Maycock was going to do a verbal report on this, but as he seems to have lost his voice <laughs> very conveniently. <laughs> um, right. There was a recommendation that went to Cabinet in December 2021. Um, and that was that the committee recommend to Cabinet the Cabinet's attention be drawn to mental health service delivery in Tamworth and request that Cabinet make it a priority for their time and concern. Um, Councillor Maycock went along to the Cabinet meeting and as a result of that, um, Cabinet agreed to hold that recommendation in abeyance following feedback of Staffordshire County Council's position in terms of health in every policy, which is something that the, um, the staff's health overview committee are looking at at the moment, um, and invite the committee back to a later cabinet for a further discussion. So that's just uh, some feedback on that. Consideration of matters referred to health and wellbeing scrutiny committee from cabinet and council, there are none. Update on health-related matters considered by Staffordshire County Council. Um, there's a written update which was attached to the agenda which provides an overview of the two staff's meetings that Daniel Maycock attended on 29th of November and the 13th of December. Um, one of the highlight dates for the Staffordshire County Council wider determinants of health session. Have we got a date for that, Dan? March, sometime in March. I can, I'll, I'll email that out. Um, just if anybody's got any questions for me through those meetings that they want to ask. <coughs> Councillor Pupil. It's not a question from the meeting, Chair, but uh, I note that Councillor Thomas Jay is not here this evening. I don't know if we've had apologies. 
No. No. Um, and I, I'm I'm a little concerned that I, I'm not sure how many meetings he has actually attended since he was appointed to this committee. But my memory is it's probably only one out of about five. Mm -hmm. um, I I really think that it would be. I think it's inappropriate if somebody's appointed to a committee and doesn't attend and doesn't actually give their apologies. And I don't know if you can take that matter up for us. Okay, I'll bear that in mind, Council of People. Um, so then I'm going to have to defer to Councillor Maycock because he's got another item from the um, Staffordshire County Council's Health and Care Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Um, the Chair of Staffordshire County Council Health and Care and Overview Scrutiny Committee stated that he would help with communications between the practices involved in the CCG um, and Councillor Maycock is still awaiting a response from that. And we now move on to agenda item 11, the forward plan. So this is to consider any further items on the forward plan which the committee would like to consider. No. no. So we're going to continue with the plan that we've got at the moment. Yep. Okay, so we move on to the health and wellbeing scrutiny work plan. The next meeting for us is on the 29th of March. We've got currently on there, we've got um, a second update for safeguarding. And I'll just invite you to make any other suggestions for anything else you might want to go on there. works rooms. Let's have a look. Where is the where's the work stream? I always end up with loads of pieces of paper and can never find the actual piece that I want. Just bear with me for a second. Councillor Maycock is um, still scribing. Uh, right, okay, yeah, yeah. So we need to have an update on the reset and recovery regarding the, the work stream. So if we can put that on the agenda for the 29th of March. The recommendation, yeah, because that recommendation that we put forward earlier would be pertinent to that. <coughs> so we now move on to agenda item 13, and this is exclusion of press and public. I'll just read out the statement. As the following item contains exemption information, move, request, second that, and vote on the following motion. That in accordance with the provisions of the local authorities, executive arrangement, meeting and access, access to information, England, regulation 2012, and section 100A4 of the Local Government Act 1972, the press and public be excluded from the meeting during the consideration of the following business on the grounds that in, it involves the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraph 3 of part 1 of schedule 12a to the act and the public interest in withholding this information outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information to the public so therefore this um, we need somebody to second that motion Councillor Michael, and we all need to take a vote on that whether we agree with that. 
information here. Okay, so that's carried. So if we can just allow time for um, the recording to, to cease.